Hi again then guys and welcome to another installment of Beards and Cars here on the channel. This is, for those who haven't watched it before, my podcast style series. Much longer form in nature where we can really get into the meat of a subject or a topic. Could be a countdown, could be a discussion between you and me down in the comments, could be conjecture or speculation about the future of a franchise, all that kind of good stuff. Now for this one, I wanted to go for another kind of wish list style video, as we've done before. We've talked about stuff like the kind of tracks that we want to see come back, the kind of cars that we want to see come back, and we have touched on features and improvements to Gran Turismo, but usually it's in particular with GT Sport. Whereas in this video, I wanted to go a little bit broader than that and just pick out five, I would say, smaller features. Some of which I've mentioned before, one in particular, but most of these I haven't really talked about that much. But five smaller features that would just, I think, improve the experience of Gran Turismo that little bit more. And again, as I said, this wouldn't necessarily need to be GT Sport. And in some ways, I think... Some of these features would work very well in GT Sport, in particular because of how limited in scope the game is compared to previous titles in terms of the content included, but it could just as well work in the future of the franchise as well in a more conventional Gran Turismo game like GT7, for instance, or GT8, whichever it ends up being. So my first one is something which kind of sets the tone for what I mean if it's still not clear, and that is from the WRC series. I can't recall if multiple WRC games featured this, but I know at least a couple of them did. And it was just this small feature that I've always liked where you could explode cars. And I don't mean damage. I don't mean explode the cars in the way of going through a rally stage and slamming into a wall. I mean that in the menu, you can actually scroll through all of the cars in the game, or the majority of them. And then if you press explode, it disassembles the car into this big mass of parts. The wheels, the doors, the bonnet, the trunk, everything comes off so that you can see all of the mechanicals and the frame of the car. Almost like looking at a Haynes manual, a mechanics manual for a, for a car. And as I said, it's a small feature. It's not something that would be necessary to Gran Turismo, but it's just something that I think would be pretty cool to have. Imagine instead of exploding those WRC cars, if you could, for instance, explode a Veyron in the game and have the doors and the trunk and everything come off, have the wing disassemble, the wheels come off, the grill, the lights, and actually be able to see the mechanicals of the car. As I said, it's not a necessary feature, it's just a really, really cool looking thing for those of us who are more mechanically minded, and it just looks really cool. The downside is, of course, it requires a huge amount of work for each car that you do that with, arguably even more so than for something with, for instance, or for something like, I should say, Auto Vista on Forza, because, of course, you can do a similar thing. You can open the doors, the trunk, get into the car, start it up, hear a little bit of chatter about the car, that kind of stuff but it's not quite to the same level as what WRC had. So that is a, just a small feature that I would love to see implemented in Gran Turismo, even if it's only for a few cars. I don't, however, think it will ever happen because it's not entirely necessary. It's not exactly something that many, if anyone else apart from me is clamoring for. It's just a feature that I quite enjoy. The second one is one that's actually in Forza, at least. I'm not sure if it's in other games as well, especially the older Forza games, and it's something which I always thought was a really smart little feature to have, and I've always preferred this feature compared to sector split times. Now, for those who don't know what that is, when you drive around a lap, especially in a race, each track has sectors, sector one, sector two, sector three, something like the Nürburgring, for instance, will have like 13 sectors, and basically, it's approximately like every mile or so around a track, generally speaking, and it will give you a split time of how quickly you got through that sector compared to your previous lap or compared to your best lap. That is the way that it's usually done, and that gives you some idea of how far ahead or how far behind you are compared to your opponents as well. That's a good method, that's what most games do. But what Forza did, or what you could do on Forza, at least if you went into the settings menu and changed it, is that as well as that split time, you could actually get 
next to the list of all of the people in the race, be it real people or AI, it would actually show you in a live way, which was constantly changing, the amount of feet, I think it was, it might have been meters, but I think it was feet, how far ahead or how far behind you are in live terms. So those numbers would constantly change, sometimes very drastically. Now again, is it necessary to the franchise? No, of course not. It's not necessary in Forza either. It's just this really cool little feature that I always love to use. I would always turn that on if I could in the game because it gives you a much more accurate representation of how far ahead you are at all times instead of having to wait for a sector. So for instance, if you mess up online, you'd be able to see that number really closing in if somebody was catching up to you. And then it would look really cool if you're in a, say, longer distance race with more laps, or an endurance, for instance, or around an oval circuit where you're starting to get a big lead, where the numbers would get bigger and bigger and bigger, and you'd get tens of thousands of feet ahead. And that, again, is just this little feature that I really like. I don't think that one would be overly difficult to implement in a Gran Turismo game. Again, I don't think they necessarily will, but it's something which I would love to see featured, because... That's not just about, you know, the enjoyment. That can appeal to racers as well. Those guys who just drive online, that's their majority experience in the game. They could certainly make use of that as well. So it's one of the few occasions where something that I really want actually kind of ties up with the people who are only interested in the online side of things. Because usually we don't have the same kind of goals for the game. Whereas that one I think could benefit us both in terms of the type of gamer that we are. The third one on the list is kind of inspired by a combination of, again, something that was done in Forza. Not so much now, though, for some reason, but especially in Forza 4, I would say it was perfected in the franchise. And it also is done in V-Rally 4, which I, of course, reviewed a few days ago. And that is sponsorship deals. And this is something which quite a few racing games are doing or have done, but it's not something that Gran Turismo has ever done. And Forza does it in a different kind of way. See, on Forza, in Forza 4 in particular as an example, you don't actually get sponsored by a particular team or product. You have an affinity with them. So you can choose whichever car you want to drive, and then by winning or by driving in that car, a combination of victory and distance, it improves your affinity with that manufacturer. And there are different levels that you can go up. There's something like Fan, um, Pro, and then like Aficionado, or something like that. I can't remember exactly what the three levels are, but it's something like that. And getting to the Aficionado level with a particular manufacturer took a long time. You had to get through like 25 levels to get up to that point. But the way it would work is that you would get discounts from that manufacturer on parts and cars. That I would love to see in Gran Turismo, and again, this would especially be on a Gran Turismo with many, many more manufacturers and cars involved, because of course the more cars you have, the more beneficial it can be. For instance, if you think back to GT6, 1200 cars, tons of manufacturers, so imagine if you chose, for instance, to represent, let's say, Audi. Then you could pick an Audi, race it, could be a rally car, could be a prototype, could be a street car. But then the amount of miles and especially the amount of victories that you get in that car improves your standing with Audi and gets you these perks. Now that's one way to do it. That's the affinity method. The other way is the way that V-Rally does it. And this is a way that a couple of games have done it. And I think, at least from memory, this tends to be the way that rally games and some touring car games. I think Toka might have done it as well. This is the way that they tend to do it, where you'll get a message in the game after you buy a certain car, and it'll be that particular manufacturer offering you a lump sum, basically. Like right at the start of V Rally 4, I chose to start with the Mini, then I got an invitation from Mini for $25,000 to drive their car and win an event. That is a great way of earning cash in a game, because it's so much more than just winning a race. Sure, that's fun, but it just makes it so much more of an immersive experience when you really feel like driving a car means something. 
Because let's be honest, most of us drive whatever car will win the race. That tends to be what racers do. That's why in games with a huge amount of cars and a heavy online presence, such as the Gran Turismo's and the Forza's, in any particular class or category, you tend to see most people, or at least most of the fast people, using the same cars over and over again. Not because they love the car, but because it's the one that will win. For instance, in Gran Turismo, say you're racing in a 500pp race online, chances are you're going to see certain cars in there. You're going to see Ford Focus RSs, you're going to see Mazda RX500s, you're going to see Dome Zeros, and a couple of others, because people don't necessarily love the car, it's just known for being fast. Likewise, in Forza, for instance, if you're racing on the Indy Oval, as an example, in the R3 class, you're going to see a NASCAR because it's just the best car for that in that category. If you're racing the Indy Oval in R2, you're going to see a Pagani Zonda R, because likewise, it's untouchable in that class for that race. People don't necessarily love it the most. Very few people would have a NASCAR as their favourite R3 category vehicle, but it's designed for oval racing, so of course it's good. What I would like to do is to help to shift that in a way that GT Sport has already started to make a move toward, of course, with the FIA representation of picking your own team to represent. That is a step in the right direction, as far as I'm concerned, and it doesn't necessarily give you the same fully immersive experience as sponsorship deals and perks and bonuses would, but it's certainly a step in that right direction. And I would actually say that of all five that I've put on this list, this one might be the most likely to happen because it kind of already has started to. So I think that the chances of that becoming more involved, maybe even with some real world implications for stuff like the Academy drivers, that could be pretty cool. It kind of already does in fact with Nissan, or at least it did. The fourth one on my list though is one which I've always thought was one of the absolute best things about this particular game, and it's something which not just Gran Turismo needs, but Forza could desperately need it as well. Pretty much any professional racing game could really do with this, and although it's not entirely necessary, it would make it look and feel that much more authentic. And that is what I'm going to call a more active driver model. And anyone who has played Driver San Francisco knows exactly what I'm talking about here. Because in Driver San Francisco, as far as I'm concerned, it has easily, by far, the most superior driver physics I have ever seen in any driving game. If you go into cockpit cam and drive any of the cars in that game and look how the driver acts, I'm not talking about the speech and the interaction with passengers, none of that just what he physically does in the car. Look at the way he turns the steering wheel. Look at the way his hand moves on the wheel when you go into reverse. Look at the way he presses the horn and actually presses the horn. The way he changes gear and it moves to the right place in the gearbox. The way he pulls the handbrake. Now, of course, most games will have some of those things covered. For instance, the driver's hand will go down to change gear, or it will go down to pull the handbrake, but most of them, they're just holding the wheel at 10 and 2, and they never move. They just put a hand off to change gear or pull the brake, and then it's back to 10 and 2 again. No matter how far you turn the steering wheel, they stay holding it at 10 and 2. So, it just looks so boring, and it's completely inaccurate, because nobody actually holds all steering wheels in that way. Sure, if you're in a formula car, you might keep that kind of position, because that's the design of the steering wheel. But if you're in like a 1970 Dodge Challenger with a steering wheel the size of a boat, you're not going to be holding it 10 and 2, especially without power steering, and turning it around and around and around with your hands in the same space. Not unless your arms are made of putty. So, Driver really had it right, because if you turned a hard corner, he would cross his hands on the wheel, which, you know, technically you shouldn't do, but he does that, and it looks that much more authentic. If you put it into reverse, he actually puts one hand behind him, in effect to look over his shoulder, and puts one palm on the steering wheel and palms it as he turns it like you actually would to reverse a car. It looks so cool how involved the driver mechanics actually are. It's so much more realistic than just this stock, I'm holding the steering wheel like a mindless robot, which Forza and Gran Turismo have always had. Now, as I said, I don't expect them to change this anytime soon, because most people who play it probably 
let's be honest, don't care. And for some race cars, such as Formula or Prototype, where the steering wheel dictates it, they do hold it that way. And because the steering rack is so shallow, in effect the car doesn't turn all that much because you go from lock to lock so quickly because it's a race car, it's not entirely necessary to have them changing the hand position. But as I said, at least for certain street cars, especially classics, you have to do that. It's just not authentic otherwise. You do not go from lock to lock in 180 degrees in a Dodge Charger or a Dodge Challenger or a Chevy Camaro or a Cobra. Imagine just turning lock to lock and it's just left to right and that's it. What kind of steering do you think that car would have? It would be ridiculous. So it's just this extra little level of authenticity which I think the game could really do with. And as I said, definitely not just Gran Turismo. And if with some cars in Gran Turismo, GT Sport in particular, if you go into cockpit view and the driver turns, you can kind of see his arm overextending and his entire shoulder comes into the frame like he's popped a joint. So again, it's it's just this extra level of of depth, really, to the game. And it's something which I've always loved about Driver San Francisco. For many people, you probably don't care, but for me, it's a very cool thing to see done so well. And after having played Driver, it stands out so much more on other games that don't do that. So it's kind of Driver's fault that I value this so much. But that's just a personal one for me. Again, I highly doubt that that's going to happen anytime soon, but I sure hope that it does. And the final one for me is the only one of these five that I've actually directly talked about before. In fact, I might have talked about the driver hand positions actually, but this one I know I have raised before in Beards and Cars a number of episodes ago. I can't recall what the exact episode was, but this is having secret cars. And I don't necessarily mean in the Gran Turismo, say, 4 method, or Gran Turismo 3 especially, where there were certain cars that weren't even in any dealership, like the Formula cars. I mean more so having a car in a dealership, but you can't see it. Almost in the way that Toka used to do it, like Toka World Touring Cars or Toka 2, where you would see the car, but it was just a black silhouette, or it was under the cliched red top covering the car. That was so cool, and of course we have talked about this before under the circumstances of people not being patient anymore. These days people want to, and unfortunately I have to say it seems to be especially geared towards youngsters, that they want to buy their way to a victory. That is one of the biggest things working against this feature ever coming back, but I really wish that it would, because younger players who haven't played stuff like Gran Turismo 4 or 3 and going into a dealership and seeing a car that has no price because you can't buy it. You can just look at it and want it. You cannot imagine, as a modern young gamer, going in with microtransactions and online play, what it felt like for those of us who went into Gran Turismo 4 for the first time and just started looking through the cars, and for me, went into the American location then scrolled along to check out the cars and see this strange dealership with a squiggle and a, a cartoon man's face. The Jay Leno dealership. And I clicked on it and went in there and saw the most insane looking car I'd ever seen in the franchise. The Jay Leno tank car with a 29.3 liter engine. But no price tag. I couldn't buy it. And from then on I was obsessed with getting that car. I was like 13 at the time, so of course I was obsessed. It's a useless car in the grand scheme of things, but it was so cool looking. It barely even fit on the screen. So from then on, I wanted to complete those driving missions to unlock this car that I could not buy. And that's a cool method, because it kind of teases you by being able to see it. But I almost like the Toka method, and some other games as well, even more, where the car cannot be seen. You can only see the shape. Because sometimes speculating about the shape of a car is actually even more fun than knowing what it is. Imagine, for instance, going into GT Sport as an example. If we had the same cars that we already had, but imagine if you went into the Ferrari dealership before any of the patches came out and the extra cars, just day one, you scroll through the Ferrari dealership and, and you can see what? Whatever we had at day one, it's like a 458, a 458 Group 4, a 458 Group 3, and then something under a tarp. Is it an Enzo? Is it a LaFerrari? And of course it would be the LaFerrari, 
but it would be under this red tarp where you could just about make out the shape but there's no name no specs no price nothing just this hidden car and then have some kind of career mode event like a ferrari challenge and you unlock it you win the car and maybe once you've unlocked it you can then see it in the dealership and buy it again if you want to something like that because it just it gives the game so much more weight it makes career mode actually worth something because let's be honest for the vast majority of us, we don't play career mode for the fun. We're just trying to find the biggest way of making money as quickly as possible, especially with these really expensive cars that we're getting, like the Mark IVs and the GT40s and the Daytonas. So for me, it just, again, like with the driver physics, it gives the game more, more depth. It, it, it harkens back to some of the glory days of franchises like Gran Turismo, where cars actually meant more. Somehow, Gran Turismo 4 having 700 cars felt more impressive than Gran Turismo 6 having 1,200, because it almost th feels like more. <laughs> it feels like there were more cars in Gran Turismo 4. And I know that's a weird thing to say, because there's almost like half as many, but it just felt more because the cars felt more impressive. There were less duplicates, there were less unnecessary vehicles, you, you could say. So for me, those are the five things that I would love to see implemented. And of course, if I thought about it long enough, I could probably come up with more. But in particular, those are my five. Being able to explode the cars, seeing the distance ahead or behind you are in feet or meters in a live sense, having sponsorships, affinity with manufacturers and parts, having an active driver mechanic engine in effect so that he actually moves in a realistic way and having hidden cars under tarps potentially or blacked out that you have to win those are my five those are the five things that i would love to see will most of them be probably not as i said i think that the most likely of the five is easily the driver sponsorships because we are already taking steps in that direction which is pretty cool but that's it for my five. Of course, I'd love to hear what your five may be in particular. You could put more if you want to, but of course you could put stuff like tuning, visual upgrades, an auction house, a storefront, that kind of stuff. And it did cross my mind, but I wanted to go more so for stuff which I hadn't talked about as much before. Whereas, of course, recently I have already talked about auction houses and upgrade parts and that kind of stuff so that's it for my pick as i said slap yours down below and of course that's it overall so i'll see you guys next week and you can click here on screen to see plenty more episodes in this series with a wide variety of topics that you can get involved with but for now as always thanks for watching